I asked you the viewers to comment your bold predictions for the upcoming season for me to talk about. I did this last year and I think it was a fun way for us to prepare for the season. So sorry I can't get to all of them, but I know everyone's got some very interesting predictions, so let's get right into it. First comment today, Gosuke Kato wins the PL batting title. Kato is a Japanese American born and raised in the United States, but he spent some time in Japan as a kid and he was drafted this past October by the Nippon Ham Fighters in the third round after playing minor league baseball for almost a decade with various major league orgs. He did finally make his MLB debut with Toronto last year, so I'm happy he finally got to have his dream come true, but at 28 years old, he's a very unusual player to be in the MPB draft. In fact, he's the first player ever with major league experience to be selected in the MPB draft. Junichi Tazawa actually had the chance to become the first a couple of years ago, but he was much older than Kato, so he went undrafted. But if you remove all of the noise around the odd circumstances of Kato's move to Hokkaido, this may actually be a sneaky good move by Tsuyoshi Shinjo. In 844 career minor league games, he slashed 255, 355, 387 with 55 home runs and 95 stolen bases. So he's not a guy with much power, but he does get on base at a decent clip and have some speed on the bases. He's also sort of a super utility man, having professional experience at every position except pitcher and catcher. So I think he fits in very nicely with this young fighters team that could really use a few veterans to smooth out the rough spots and fill in some defensive holes. He's also registered as a Japanese player, despite technically being a foreigner born outside of Japan. So that also gives the fighters some more flexibility with the roster. With all that said, I don't think a batting title is really possible for him. He needs to adjust to MPB pitching just like any other foreign player. And it's not like he's got crazy good bat to ball skills or anything. So I think he can be a solid contributor, but more or less as a role player hitting around league average. Moving on to the next comment, staying in Hokkaido, Kotaro Kiyomiya and Chusei Manami hit over 30 homers each. If this prediction comes true, there's a very good chance that the fighters climb out of the cellar and make the playoffs because, like I said before, the fighters have this incredibly young position player core that doesn't have much in the way of experience, but does have a ton of upside, and Kiyomiya and Manami are definitely two of the headline guys. They have Go Matsumoto, who's coming off a batting title of his own, and they signed Ariel Martinez this offseason, but it's going to be awfully tough for them to make up for the loss of franchise superstar Kensuke Kondo. So it's up to this crop of prospects like Kiyomiya, Manami, Yuta Imagawa, Yuki Nomura, and Daigo Kamikawabata to establish themselves as quality everyday players with the fighters entering their new stadium, Escon Field Hokkaido. Regardless of Kiyomiya's early struggles at the MPB level, the fact of the matter is he's still only 23 years old. He was regarded as a generational prospect at one point in time, and that kind of talent doesn't just go away. He still has it in him to be one of the best sluggers in Japan, even if Munetaka Murakami has completely stolen the limelight from him. Shinjo made him lose weight last year, and he hit a career-high 18 homers with a 120 WRC Plus in 129 games. He still whiffs a lot and looks too indecisive at the plate at times, but I think he needs to just let it loose and let his raw power take over. Forget about hitting for average, forget about avoiding strikeouts. I don't care if this guy hits 220 with 200 strikeouts if he hits 30 plus bombs. If he can strike fear in pitchers, they will eventually pitch around him and that will enable him to draw more walks and maintain a decent on-base percentage. As for Manami, just watch some of his highlights from camp. He has insane power, and he can drive almost any pitch out of the park. Last season, he had the worst whiff rate in the league for players with at least 200 plate appearances, and still managed to hit 14 bombs in 100 games. So he needs to make a Teruaki Sato-esque jump in his plate discipline this season. Sato lowered his O swing percentage from 41.6% to 33.2%, and his whiff rate from 40.9% to 25.7% in 2022. Manami's O swing percentage and whiff rate last season was 42.8% and 41.1% respectively, so they do profile quite similarly. If he can improve in these areas even a little bit, he can easily be a 30 homer candidate. 
I've been on the Montami hype train for a while, so I hope he's able to finally break out here in his age 22 season. Alright, next comment here, Takahisa Hayakawa has a bounce back. I for one am still a believer in Hayakawa. He was contested by four teams at the 2020 draft before Rakuten won the lottery, so he was clearly regarded as a top tier prospect back then, and I don't think one underwhelming year changes that. Now, he did have to get surgery over the offseason, and his peripheral numbers looked pretty bad last year, but he still posted the exact same ERA as his rookie season at 3.86, so he was still a serviceable pitcher. The main area of concern for him in 2022 was the home run rate. Even with the dead balls, where most pitchers were giving up fewer homers than ever, Hayakawa's home run rate exploded from 0.7 per 9 innings to 1.6 per 9 innings, and his ground ball rate went from 45.8% to 32.3%. His strikeout and walk rates were still pretty good, so the good news is it's a pretty straightforward solution. Just get the ball on the ground more. Now that's obviously easier said than done, but I think he's really one small adjustment away from becoming one of the most dominant southpaws in the league. So yes, I think Hayakawa can and will bounce back. It's just a matter of whether the Eagles are going to keep faith in him and let him work things out in the rotation. Up next, Roberto Osuna wins PL MVP by leading MPB in saves and posting a sub-1 ERA. As ridiculous as I think it is that a closer could possibly be the most valuable player in the league, this is MPB award voting we're talking about, and Dennis Sarfate did win PL MVP in 2017 over Yuki Yanagita, so anything is possible. Now, I will admit, Sarfate was nuts that year. He had a 1.09 ERA with 102 strikeouts in 66 innings, and he set the single-season MPB saves record with 54. But the Hawks won 94 games that year. They were one of the best teams in modern history. So it does take something pretty special for a closer to win MVP, but I can see a scenario where Osuna pulls it off. Basically, the Hawks would need to win the pennant without any position player sticking out with an especially great year, which I guess is possible given how much depth SoftBank has. And then Osuna would need to pretty much replicate his success in the second half with the Marines last season over the course of an entire year. So we're talking like 40 saves with an 0.90 ERA. That might be enough for him to win the MVP, especially if he has some big memorable moments closing out games against PL rivals. So I won't say this one is impossible, but it's ultimately not that likely. Let's stay in Fukuoka, but this time the prediction is that the Hawks will fail to proceed to the Climax Series. So this would mean that the Hawks missed the playoffs for three straight years after winning six of seven Japan Series titles, and that would obviously be a monumental failure for this storied franchise that made huge moves this offseason to try to retake the crown. They lost Kodai Senga, of course, but they rebuilt their entire foreign core, bringing in guys like Williams Astadio, Courtney Hawkins, Roberto Osuna, and Joe Gunkel, while also reinforcing their already potent lineup with the best pure hitter in all of MPB, Kensuke Kondo. Oh, and by the way, they signed Kohei Arihara after he spent a few years in MLB. This team is just so deep up and down. Honestly, they're probably the only team that could field a second team at the MPB level with their current players in the organization and still have success because there are just so many great players on this team that won't get much playing time since there's no room for them on the top team. They're my early Japan Series favorites for sure, and I just can't see them finishing any worse than second place in the PL. I mean, everything would have to go wrong for that to happen. We're talking about a scenario where Yuki Yanagida keeps regressing to like a league average bat, Roya Kurihara becomes a shell of his former self after the injury, Kenta Imamiya goes back to his 2021 form, Kensuke Kondo gets injured, the pitching staff completely collapses on itself without Senga stabilizing it. You see what I'm saying? It's just a seriously unlikely set of circumstances for me. The Hawks are legit contenders this year, just as they are every year. Okay, enough Pacific League stuff, let's finish off with a few Central League predictions, and the first one is that Kazuyoshi Tatsunami's aggressive roster turnover pays off, and the Dragons make the playoffs. I feel like most people either hated the Dragons offseason or loved it and there was no in-between, and I'll be honest, I was very skeptical of Tatsunami's decisions for the longest time, and I still am to an extent, but then I thought, you know what, the Dragons haven't made the playoffs since 2012, why not switch things up and try something totally new? What's there to lose? Tatsunami maneuvered a lot of big moves this offseason. They traded away their captain, Toshiki Abe, one of their only plus bats in the lineup, 
to Rakuten and got 36-year-old starting pitcher Hideaki Wakui in return. They traded away former Rookie of the Year Yota Kyoda to DNA and got middle reliever Yoshiki Tsunada in return. They poached slugging prospect Seiya Hosokawa from DNA in what is MPB's version of the Rule 5 draft. And they signed a high-risk, high-reward slugger in Aristides Aquino as well as bringing back Zoilo Almonte. On the surface, most of these moves don't make much sense for a team that A. already had great pitching, and B. needed more stable power in the lineup. They decided to address these problems by doubling down on the pitching, constructing one of the strongest rotations in all of Japan, as well as a solid bullpen, and by getting rid of some veteran hitters to create a fresh slate for their plethora of young infielders and new foreign sluggers to come in. So, this has the potential to go terribly wrong and make the Dragons even worse than they were before. Or, it may actually change the culture of this team and make them competitive again. That stadium is just an absolute behemoth, so it's not going to be easy for anyone to hit over 20 home runs there, but if Takaya Ishikawa and Aristides Aquino and Kenta Bright can break through, and they continue to get steady production from the likes of Yohei Oshima, Yuki Okabayashi, and Diane Vichiedo, then I think this team's stacked pitching staff can carry them to the promised land. Admittedly, this isn't a particularly likely scenario, but it's one that I'd like to believe can become a reality. Moving on, the next prediction is that there will be foreign players that hit over 30 home runs for the first time in four years, Aquino, Frank Schwindel, and Matt Davidson being favorites. I think you're right that a foreign player will hit 30 bombs this year, but I actually don't think it's one of the guys named here. That doesn't mean they won't do well, it just means I don't think they'll reach 30. History tells us that it's more likely that a hitter that's been in Japan for more than a year will have the best chance of reaching the 30 mark. So my money would be on Gregory Polanco, now of the Lote Marines, or maybe Domingo Santana of the Occult Swallows. He does strike out a lot, but he absolutely demolishes the ball when he makes contact, ranked top 5 in MPB in a hard hit percentage last year, so he just needs to stay healthy. But out of all the new foreign sluggers coming in, I actually think Courtney Hawkins has the best chance of reaching 30 because he has some of the best raw power in the world. Just watch him take BP. He also profiles very similarly to longtime Hawk Alfredo Despine in terms of physique, so it's going to take many years of success to live up to Despine's legacy, but I like what I see so far from Hawkins. Next prediction, Koji Chikamoto will get off to a hot start and end the season with just over 200 hits. I love this prediction, but I don't think 200 hits is in reach for anyone at this point in time. There's only been 7 instances in MPB history where a player had a 200 hit season. Most recently in 2015 when Shogo Akiyama broke the single season hits record with 216, and Nori Aoki actually did it twice. What a legend. So needless to say, it's extremely rare, but I suppose if anyone could do it in the current environment, it would be Chikamoto. Okabayashi is a good candidate too, but Chikamoto hits at the top of the Tigers lineup, he's always stayed relatively healthy, and he makes a ton of contact. He had 154 hits in 132 games last year, and he had 178 hits in 140 games the year before. So he is pretty close, but it's those extra 20-something hits that are always the hardest to get. I will say though, if he gets enough Babbitt luck, maybe he can pull it off. I wouldn't bet on it personally, but I'd love to be proven wrong here. Alright, so that just about does it. Again, sorry if I didn't get to yours, but there were a lot of them this time and I wanted to make sure to talk about some of these in quite some depth. Let me know what other bold predictions you have in the comments below, and let's see how many of these come true at the end of the 2023 season. As always, thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe for more MPB content in English.